an unprecedented event is currently unfolding at the wind-scale atomic plant. Our cameras have captured the dramatic scenes surrounding this nuclear facility. Brave fire crews, drawn from across Cumbria, are engaged in a fierce battle to contain atom fires that are tearing through Britain's nuclear reactor. Meanwhile, scientists are working tirelessly to bring the situation under control. However, a deadly cloud of radioactive smoke is sweeping over the picturesque Lake District, plunging it into catastrophic disaster. Radioactive fallout is raining down on farms and communities, creating an alarming situation. Authorities are taking swift and decisive action to control the unfolding crisis. Emergency services, military personnel and courageous firefighters are on the front lines, desperately trying to prevent further catastrophe. As the fallout is carried eastwardly by the winds, sparsely inhabited villages and farms in the Cumbrian Lake District are facing an unprecedented crisis. A cloud of uncertainty descends upon the land, leading to widespread evacuations for the safety of local communities. Families are hastily packing their belongings, livestock is being moved to safer grounds, and villages are becoming ghost towns as residents heed the evacuation orders. The once peaceful and vibrant landscape is now marked by signs of mass exodus. Despite the challenges, community spirit shines through as neighbours lend a helping hand embodying the resilience and unity that defines the British spirit in times of adversity. As the crisis continues to unfold, the nation watches with bated breath, hoping for a swift resolve. This is a test of our collective strength and determination in the face of unforeseen challenges. We will keep you updated as the situation develops. Despite radiation contamination, much of the Lake District, this very English Chernobyl, did not create an exclusion zone. Had it done so, the Lake District would be vastly different today. With a national park spanning some 2,300 square kilometres, it could have transformed into a true wilderness, large enough to sustain populations of wolves, deer and lynx. Instead, we are left with a very human-made landscape. So what does this have to do with Britain's countryside being racist? That headline alone contains a vast amount of detail to unpack, so bear with me as I delve into the subject. Central to the assertion that the countryside is possibly racist is the issue of unequal access to these natural spaces, and I'll be dealing with that in some detail. Initially, I visited the Lake District to create a video exploring its geology. But my off-season experience there raised different questions. Ultimately, it comes down to how we relate to nature, the romanticization of the countryside, the notion of wilderness, and the collective decisions we make about these spaces. The Lake District is home to England's only mountains. The upland areas of Dartmoor, the Cheviots, and the Pennines have peaks that reach 800 meters or less, classifying them as hills rather than mountains. Excluding England's inshore waters, which remain a true wilderness, the Lake District is as wild as it gets, and yet it's still a landscape heavily shaped by human activity. One of the most striking differences between wild and managed landscapes is the woodlands. In their natural state, these areas would be covered in forests rather than bare mountainsides. Trees like birch, mountain ash and juniper would grow even at a higher altitude. Scots pine, in fact, can grow higher than any British mountain range. In the valleys, oak, ash, lime and hazel would dominate the landscape. There still be open moorlands and scrubland in areas where the soil is too thin or boggy, and natural clearings managed by deer and beavers. Today, however, these native habitats survive only in tiny pockets, and sometimes preserved by humans, even in the Lake District. To truly grasp what was lost, one would need to look to certain parts of Scotland now. This wild England was once home to animals like the brown bear, which was common 2,000 years ago, but likely extinct by the beginning of the medieval period, or around about 1,000 years ago. Wolves survived a bit longer. The Norse word Ulf, meaning wolf, is preserved in the Lake District place name, Oswater. However, a campaign of eradication led to the extinction in England by about the 15th century. Wild bulls, wild horses and wild cattle were also once features of wild England, as were the lynx and the beaver. These animals were hunted to extinction, but many other species, such as frogs, butterflies and birds, 
have been lost due to habitat destruction. In the Lake District, subsistence farming, primarily sheep rearing for wool, beginning in the 13th century, has stripped the mountains bare. The sport of grouse shooting has led to the burning of heather to encourage its growth, whilst lowland bogs have been drained and improved for livestock grazing. Woodlands survived because they were managed for charcoal production and bodging, the woodworking trades like bobbin making, which served the textile industry. The mountains of the Lake District may appear wild and untamed, and indeed geologically they are. These peaks were pushed out by a volcanic intrusion 500 million years ago when the microcontinent of Avalonia collided with Scotland and North America, and they were later sculpted by glaciers over the last two and a half million years. However, these bold mountains are now little more than green deserts. Even with this human-made environment, the Lake District today pre presents varied aspects. There are the peaks where dedicated enthusiasts will pack a rucksack for the day, wear sensible shoes, catch the bus, and enjoy a low-cost communion with the mountains. Then there is the working and industrial landscape. Although many quarries and mines have shut down, some stone quarries remain active. And there are still working farms. The Bees, the National Trust, is the largest landowner in the region, earning a fifth of all of the land, some 60,000 hectares of farmland, 90 farms, and approximately have a herd of 55,000 herdwig sheep. It's a Norse breed that was once in danger of extinction. The days of small 100 to 200 acre hill farms with mixed dairy and livestock operations are long gone. Today, farmers must either expand significantly or supplement their income with holiday rentals to survive. The National Trust helps sustain traditional farming practices by subsidising them through their membership. It maintains the cultural landscape, preserving walls and traditional farm buildings, as well as the local sheep breed. And with careful management, it sustains pasture with greater diversity, encouraging the growth of flowers and insects. The idyllic nature of some farms, which seem frozen in a past from about 80 or so or more years ago, is deliberate and well considered. Modern farming, particularly livestock hill farming, aims to maximise income by planting fast-growing ryegrass, ensuring fields are well drained and eliminating competition from weeds. This often involves making fields larger by re removing walls and hedgerows. Originally, at the very dawn of civilization, farming created pasture habitats, a varied mixture of grasses and legumes and wildflowers that held back the forest and created ecological niches for plants, animals and insects. However, the demand for cheap meat, beef and lamb, has pushed farming towards monoculture. Whilst other countries can maintain vast feedlots where animals are fed cheap protein from large prairies, Britain's farmers are compelled to maintain a monoculture of grass to stay competitive. Silage, a fermented grass product developed over the 20th century, involves cutting green grass early, preventing wildflowers from seeding. This practice is largely being replaced by baled haylage. The old-fashioned hay, harvested after meadow flowers have seeded, has become a rarity. The Lake District has the theme park aspect, the attractions, the shopping, the holy trinity of fashionable outdoor wear, the double yellow lines, the expensive National Trust car parks, fine dining, and of course, Goodness. Beatrix Potter, a sanitised and amusing I'm take on wildlife. Must get out. Is this the way? Before 1800, the Lake District was considered wild, a place no self-respecting city folk would choose to visit. In 1724, Daniel Defoe described the area as the wildest, most barren and frightful of any that I have passed over in England. By 1778, Father Thomas West published A Guide to the Lakes for the more adventurous souls seeking a taste of wild peaks and lakes. However, it was a local figure who truly changed the perception of the area. On his way to see the cultural delights of Italy, he was struck by the sublime beauty of the Swiss Alps. That young man was William Wordsworth, a superstar of his day. Wordsworth helped popularise romanticism, connecting deeply with nature, which soon became all the rage as people set out to find their own version of the Alps in Britain. 
tourism blossomed in the Lake District. Artists sought out vistas to inspire their work, and the rich built country retreats, often planting trees to make the landscape appear more alpine. As tourism grew, so did the need for infrastructure, and hotels and bars sprang up to cater for visitors. Jane Austen even mentions the Lake District as a destination for a romantic wilderness in Pride and Prejudice, although her characters settled for the less dramatic Peak District instead. The Romanticism is reflected in the Lake District's architecture, and it began to reflect the styles of the Swiss Alps. Up to the mid-19th century, enjoying the peaks and lakes was largely the privilege of the richer middle classes, who could afford the time and the cost of travel by carriage. However, this changed when Lancaster and Carlisle Railway Company decided to extend the line from Kendall to the hamlet of Berthwaite, which would later become Windermere Station. The Kendall-Windermere branch line opened in April 1847 and in its first year it carried ten times the number of passengers that had paid the road tolls on the Kendall Windermere Turnpike just a few years earlier. The railways opened up the countryside to the working classes. After World War I, the popularity of hiking among city workers soared. Though this was often met with resistance from landlords and estate owners, a local walking enthusiast and the Lake District guide writer, Henry Jenkinson, organized the first mass trespass on private land in October 1887, joined by 2,000 protesters to reclaim a footpath. On this occasion, the courts ruled in favor of the protesters, opening the path to the public. This set a precedent for the more famous mass trespass on Kinter Scout in the Peak District in 1932, which led to the imprisonment of some of the protesters but ultimately contributed to the right to roam movement. As part of this working class movement to reclaim access to the mountains, organisations like the Youth Hostling Association and the Ramblers Association emerged during the interwar years. And it's high in the 1970s and 80s, you can have a very cheap hiking holiday in the lakes. That's a very young me on the left. How very innocent. I hitchhiked to the Lake District in late March to catch the snow and met other adventurous hikers to travel safely in the mountains. It was a very different experience then. We returned from the pub in Coniston after the closing time at the youth hostel, which was 10pm, and ended up sleeping in the old quarry building used by the Barrow and Furness Mountaineering Club. That building has since been converted into a fancy venue where you can host wedding receptions. I don't remember W lines then, and no parking signs, but then again, there were about as half as many cars on the road in the late 70s. I do remember the fine local hours, and thankfully, that at least remains the same. There's still plenty of youth hostels, and they offer affordable accommodation for me back in 1979, costing about £6 a night in today's prices. The cheapest price today ranges from between... 15 and 20 pounds per night, and with limited beds you have to book early. Change has brought far greater visitor numbers and an estimated 20 million people annually visit the Lake District, and it generates over a billion pounds in spending. However, this influx has also shifted the local community dynamics. With more commuters and second homeowners moving in, a terraced house now costs a staggering 400,000 pounds. There have always been large houses around the lakes, especially in Windermere. Since Victorian times, the area has attracted the very wealthy who built country retreats. This brings us to the question, is the countryside racist? Of course, we shouldn't blindly trust newspaper headlines. They thrive on controversy to drive engagement. One such headline originated from a report to MPs by the Wildlife and Countryside Link. It's an umbrella organisation representing charities ranging from the British Bat Conservation Trust to Greenpeace. The report focusing on climate change, nature conservation and access to the countryside highlighted that climate change disproportionately impacts the global south, despite emissions being primarily generated by the affluent global north. Even within Britain, 
poorer communities, particularly ethnic minorities in cities, are more vulnerable due to poor housing, pollution and environmental degradation and a lack of resources for adaption and access to green spaces. The report also points out that colonialism, the exploitation of developing countries by the developed world, contributes to climate change, exploited people and their environment and erased rights. In the context of Britain, it acknowledges that these old racist colonial legacies continue to frame nature in the UK as a predominantly white space with people of colour often feeling out of place in these environments and within the environmental sector. Interestingly, the report notes that environmental NGOs have very few black and ethnic minority staff in senior positions, though this issue wasn't highlighted in any of the newspaper articles. Instead, the media largely dismissed the idea of the countryside being racist refusing to consider that minorities might not feel welcome. It would be more honest, like farmers blocking lay or boulders to prevent gypsies and travellers, that these commentators admit they don't care, or they don't want certain people in the countryside. That would at least acknowledge that there is an issue. A century ago, the landed gentry made it clear that city folk were not welcome on the moors and estates. This recent visit to the lakes, I found a degree of unwelcome that I didn't experience as a 17-year-old. It felt like entering into a gated community. Not of original Cumbrians, but of an influx of wealth. The WLA lines, the expensive National Trust car parks, free only to members, felt like a club. And it, and it is. Membership for a family costs £160 per year, roughly the same as a Netflix subscription. On the other hand, National Trust Scotland offers a better deal. I visited Lord Summer Isles, also known as Colzine Castle, for just £6. And the gardens were free, with a guided tour included. Meanwhile, the National Trust Beatrix Potter House cost £15, or £7.50 for children. Now, speaking of Summer Isle, the fictional Scottish island in the Wicker Man, there is indeed a suspicion of rustic folk and their strange ways by city dwellers. Country folk are generally more conservative and less familiar with the diversity of the city. When I worked in Wales in the 1990s, it was almost acceptable to be gay if you were from the city, but it was impossible for locals to come out. Fortunately, 25 years on, things have changed. However, many of us have walked into a rural bar and been met with an awkward silence and uncomfortable stares. Imagine that having to you because you are different in a more visible way. It's not uncommon for country folk to ask where you're from. In Wales, I tell people I'm from a Welsh village, but because I don't have a Welsh accent, they often ask, where am I really from? Sadly, this is a common experience for people of colour. A century ago, the working classes fought for the right to enjoy their countryside, to have equal access, to seize control of the mountains from the lords who were gifted them a thousand years ago or who stole common land through the Enclosures Act two centuries ago. Now, country folk have every reason to fear change. They have every reason to fear hordes of people turning up, leaving gates open, parking irresponsibly, littering, pushing up house prices as holiday homes, and meddling with traditions. Some of that change they have to suck up. It is no longer legal to hunt with packs of hounds, dump waste into waterways, destroy riverbanks, or allow gamekeepers to annihilate birds of prey. But the Lake District cannot sustain unlimited numbers of visitors, cars, or tents in its most visited spots. So this brings me back to my fantasy of a Holocene Park, a nuclear exclusion zone rich in native wildlife. How would we manage that? In Poland, the Białowieża, and I'm not going to pronounce it, National Park, a Holocene Park with bison, lynx, wolves and a primal forest, is similar in size to the Lake District. The park is controlled with guided tours and hosts about 150,000 visitors annually. Clearly, it is not nature for all. Now, the Lake District is not going to become a wild park, though there are moves to encourage native woodland on the hills and beavers are being successfully reintroduced into Britain. 
There's no shortage of space for visitors in the mountains. It's only in tourist hot spots like Irwith uh, in Wales where numbers become a problem. Back in 1979, affordable train and bus services, along with cheap accommodation through the YHA, allowed me to experience the mountains and lakes. The YMCA Lakeside Base still allows city kids to enjoy holidays filled with hiking and canoeing. However, places are limited and train fares are expensive. I was born on a farm and my parents went on holiday in the countryside. So your attitudes to the countryside can be very dependent on who your parents are. But for many, especially those growing up in the cities, haven't been exposed to the countryside. When workers from the Indian subcontinent came to English cities and towns to work on the mills or do the jobs the English wouldn't do, they sought the bright lights, community and opportunities of the city. Second and third generation immigrants, however, did go to raves in the middle of nowhere to wake up in some stunning countryside, and it's had its impact. I was travelling in Scotland with a friend on the NC500, the remote 500 mile road trip, and it tracks a lot of kids, particularly Asian boys, in their pimped up beamers and golfs, and my friend wondered, was it alright that these terraways were racing around Scotland? In the lakes there is the Hard Knot Pass, Britain's most windy, steep road, and it's the only time I saw Asian city kids on my visit to the lakes. And sure, boy racers can be a menace, but if they behave, and take their litter home and camp sen sensibly, then it's fine. It is their country too, and I've seen them in Scotland when they get out of their cars and park up and camp, that they are blown away. We need more accessibility, but not more cars or second homes or litter or sewage. England desperately needs more wilderness and wildlife spread across the country to relieve pressure on places like the Lake District and Snowdonia. Here's a disturbing fact. Wildlife, excluding marine life in the UK, as a percentage of biomass, i.e. tons of, makes up just 3.5%, while farm animals constitute 96.5%. Add in the huge biomass of humans, and our pets and wild mammals and birds account for a little over 2%. Chickens and dogs and cats outweigh all of the wildlife in Britain. And that includes Scotland and its deer population. Land that could be considered wild, like moor, native woodland, marsh or bog, in England is only about 11%. While grassland for livestock covers about 35%. So perhaps if we ate a little less meat, there would be more room for wildlife. More space for us to enjoy, more walking and cycling, and we'd have a healthier diet. I'm not advocating veganism, but I am suggesting we eat less meat, pay farmers more for quality produce, and reduce intensive farming on marginal land. Following Brexit and the loss of EU farm subsidies, the Welsh Government proposes a new subsidy scheme for farmers, paying them to maintain a bit more woodland and diverse farmland. 10% woodland in total for the farm, including hedges and individual trees, and 10% nature diverse land, which could be pasture with more wildflowers and grasses, or waterways, or semi cultivated moorland. Yet, this has been met with a great deal of opposition. Now, it's a great idea to encourage more diversity in farming to encourage different income streams, such as a farm shop, or holiday lets, camping, or speciality products like cheese or pies. But farmers are farmers. How would you feel if someone insisted you take on a new profession as well as your existing profession? If we want more nature and local access to wilderness so we don't swamp the few national parks, we have to pay for it. The government could pay farmers a fair rate for reducing production, 10-15% of their normal income, to remove 10 or 50% of their normal production. The government could also buy farms as they came up for sale and allow them to revert to nature where appropriate. Here is where I do an about turn and praise the National Trust. They are buying up farms in the Lake District and other national parks when they come up for sale. They are converting them to a balanced form of farming, encouraging flower meadows and preserving rare breeds that would be lost to industrial farming. 
They are maintaining the cultural heritage of stone walls and traditional barns and hedgerows. And they are being funded by their membership. The report that sparked the headlines highlight that England desperately needs more wildlife and wilderness. It feels very colonial to tell African nations, once colonies of the empire, that they must preserve their forests and wilderness when we have decimated our own lands. Expanding wilderness in England needs to be spread across the country so that hotspots are not inundated with visitors and landowners who claim they are custodians must do their fair share. I say England because on my visits to Scotland, I have noticed not only do they have more space for wilderness and rewilding, far more ethnic minorities can be seen enjoying the countryside. Part of this, I think, is because Scotland has enshrined in law the right to roam and camp. England, on the other hand, only has a very limited right to roam in mountains and moors, with no right to camp. But even in England, where there is access, whether through public transport, footpath, or a freedom to roam, such as the Peak District, minority communities in the cities do visit. Now, I'm opinionated and political, but I try to remain apolitical in my videos because I believe the best route is to inspire people to go out, learn, enjoy our countryside, and connect with nature. I'm also aware that some are simply unable to experience the countryside and I hope my videos help share what I see and learn. This land is our land. There must be access for all, but also responsibility for all. City folk must follow a few rules, as must country folk, farmers and landowners. So I hope you've enjoyed this video. Do comment, do tell me what you think, like and subscribe.